not put. Uh, in other words, the legitimacy of the basic propositions that have underpinned a lot of child protection policy in many, many countries are not challenged, except in one space, and that's where it comes to the Internet. And one of, one of my basic uh, points is I don't see any reason why, just because the Internet is around and this new technology has developed, is that we should abandon any notion that we no longer have a responsibility to try and uphold rules that we've developed for different reasons over many, many, uh, many, many years. But here's a couple of the problems that I see with this debate, and I'm, Anjan's absolutely right. There's certainly not going to be an, a finished or definitive view at the end of today. There can't be uh, much smarter people that, 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 than me, certainly, have, tried, have been wrestling with these issues for years. One of the problems with the debate is, is it tends to take place again on a very, very broad spectrum a very, and, a, and at a very high level of, of generalization. We speak about children and young people as if they were an, a homogenous group. They ain't. Um, there's a whole range of different vulnerabilities, different capabilities uh, existing amongst, amongst young people and families. Even within, even within the same age ranges, there can be vast differences between between, between children's capacities and vulnerabilities and so on. And, you know, one of the things that we hear all of the time is the importance about media literacy as being one of the keys to unlock all this. And, of course, I'm absolutely 100% in favor of media literacy. The best defense, the best protection for any child under any circumstances, anywhere in life, including the way they use the Internet, is what they themselves know, what's between their left ear and their right ear. Those are always going to be the best tools. But tell me, how does media literacy work with three-year-olds and four-year-olds? 37% uh, of three- and four-year-olds are going online regularly in the United Kingdom. 9% of three- and four-year-olds have their own iPad or tablet. Both of those numbers are going to go up as the technology gets cheaper and more, more easily available. How, tell me, how does media literacy work with three- and four-year-olds? What you then end up with is wagging your finger and saying to parents, now you mustn't let three and four-year-olds go on or use the internet unsupervised. But we know wagging your finger doesn't work. Look at other areas of social policy. Look at, look at family breakdowns. Look at teenage pregnancy. Look at a whole range of other areas where we have tried to talk to people and tried to persuade people, uh, families, parents, to behave in a particular way. Um, and it hasn't been as anything like as successful as we would have wanted it to be, uh, and it's exactly the same, I'm afraid, in the area of the Internet, and that's why I think the technology companies who develop this wonderful technology have a particular responsibility to do everything they can, both at the level of education and awareness, but also at a technical level, to try and support good practices amongst parents and good, good protection for kids. Um, because let's be clear, never, never before has a social space like the internet existed. By and large, you know, we go through, you know, we go through life more or less associating with people of our own age or with, within our own social groups and within our own social class. And uh, actually, when you think about the rules about uh, the kind of material that we can access, uh, cinema rules about gambling and alcohol and all of these things, these are framed in, ter in that way in terms of the in terms of age groups and so on. The Internet's very disruptive in the, in the sense that, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm simply stating it as a fact, that the Internet, nothing like it has existed before where on a very, very large scale, such a very wide range of people of different ages, different social backgrounds, different attitudes are brought together uh, in, the way that, in, the, in the way that it is. And, I, and I, I just don't think that the way that we're handling things at the moment is likely to be sustainable in, in the long run. So I guess my, my basic point and my, complete, uh, my concluding point is this. The Internet is trying to do too much for too many people across too diverse a range of interests. And that, in the long run, is not going to be sustainable. We're going to have to move to an environment where we have a lot, a, a, a much, much greater de degree of certainty about who users are and, and once we have that, then I think a lot of other things will start to fall into place. So that's not an argument against free speech. It's not an argument against kids having access to information. I'm absolutely uh, very strongly in favor of that. Of course I am. But it is an argument for saying that we need to think of a better way of doing it than we've managed up to now.
Um, uh, if I may just add uh, or ask you a question or to clarify, when you said that um, internet is trying to do too much or too many things, uh, who are you referring to here? No, uh, m my point is that the, the vast range of ages, the, the range of ages that are, are mixing in a single space, uh, the range of materials that are accessible to three and four year olds just as they are to 50 year olds and 60 year olds, that's never been, that's never existed before. Un it's only really through the internet that, that these sorts of questions have really taken on any salience and I don't think in the long run that that position is, is sustainable. Um, it's never worked in human history before. I don't think the mere fact that the internet now exists and that you've got these big platforms which are allowing that type of exchange to happen. I don't think that necessarily means that's the end of the debate and that we have to accept that as a permanent fact of life forever. In fact, I'm absolutely certain it will not be a, a fact of life forever because it, 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 it's already showing signs of not working well enough. And I think those signs will get worse, not better, unless we act. First of all, John, it's good that you said that the internet um, isn't is doing too much in front of an American because you know we own the internet, and um, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll take care of that. In fact, in fact, the next time our government shuts down, maybe we'll we'll get somebody to turn the internet off for a while, and and then we won't be doing anything like the government. Um, we need to remember here that we're talking about speech. Now, I know that the First Amendment to the United States Constitution is a local ordinance. It doesn't apply to the United Kingdom or any other country. Uh, but it's a kind of an important principle. And the last time I read it, there was, there was no age qualification. It didn't say anything about you had to be a certain age to enjoy freedom of speech. It, 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 it's a universal declaration. Yet, having said that, even in our own country, in fact, perhaps especially in my own country, there has never particularly been any respect for the, the rights of children uh, when it comes to speech, when it comes to freedom of assembly. There's an enormous concern about the rights of children to be safe and secure, to be protected. That is very much uh, part of our ethos, at least of late, although sometimes one wonders whether that's properly applied given the number of kids that are in poverty and obese and, and having other issues. But in, theoretically, people would all agree that children need to be protected. When it comes to the rights of children, it's almost as if children are the property of their parents. Uh, that is very much true in the United States. In fact, I have to say that the country that you live in, John, and I think many of the countries here actually have a more progressive attitude towards children's privacy, for example, than the United States does. In the United States, children have no presumption of any privacy vis-a-vis -vis their own parents. A parent has the right to snoop on the child at any point, at any time, in any medium. And in fact, as I understand it, uh, that is not the case in much of Europe and the, United, and the United Kingdom where children actually have real privacy rights in that no one, including their own parents, have a right to impose. So, uh, you know, this is not, I am not coming from a position of any moral superiority uh, when I come, in terms of the country I happen to, to, to live in and come from. Uh, but I do think that this speech issue becomes a very important thing, that we're not talking about consumption of alcohol here. In fact, we're not even talking about consumption at all, although consumption is part of it. We're also talking about participation in the civic discussion. We're talking about the ability to engage. I am particularly concerned, for example, uh, of the fact that there are limitations on social media. In schools, it is often filtered out and banned, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, uh, or, or, or Twitter, or other social media platforms where people of all ages uh, are communicating and interacting. Um, I am also concerned about some of the policies. For example, I was very pleased when just the last week Facebook lifted its policy that prohibited teenagers to post in public. Now, many people thought that was a great policy because it prevented, it protected children against their own bad judgment uh, from exposing themselves. But I think about uh, this amazing young woman, uh, Malala Yousafi, I hope I'm pronouncing her, last, her name correctly, the 16-year-old from Pakistan who was shot at, um, injured, uh, for uh, campaigning for the rights of girls and women. She's been on television. She's made speeches. I believe there was a documentary film made about her. She has reached out. She's talked to people. She's organized. She's public. Until last week, she couldn't have posted on Facebook in a public manner. So her free speech rights to do what she does off of Facebook were muzzled. And so in a column that I, I, I wrote this morning on this very subject for the Saturday Mercury News, I started thinking about my own background. 
Uh, as you can tell by the gray hair, I've been around for a few years. And although I wasn't particularly active myself as a teenager during the civil rights movement in the 60s, uh, I was very much aware of it. And I did become active later as a young college student in both the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam War movement. And it was young people, not just college students, high school teenagers, who put themselves on the line, who made speeches, who appeared on radio, who appeared on television, who in some cases were tear gassed, beaten, and arrested for their political and social beliefs, and who changed the world. Who, along with Martin Luther King and other adults, turned around over a hundred years of, of, of horrible racism, racism, it didn't turn around completely, but uh, got us a, a monumental civil rights act. Those young people, if they were to have that same campaign today, would not be allowed to post on that, to, would not have been allowed to post in certain social networking sites because they weren't old enough uh, to enjoy the rights because, God forbid, they might do something that would harm them. And so this notion of protectionism, and while, of course, I, I'm not going to argue with you, John, about whether a two- or three-year-old should be protected from looking at, at porn or anything else that may be psychologically or uh, harmful uh, you know, on their iPads, and I do think we need to find ways to um, make sure that children can use this, the very young children can use this technology um, without having to be exposed to inappropriate content. But when it comes to teenagers or even tweens in some cases, it turns out that, that you know, kids have curiosity, kids are interested. Uh, there is going to, it's going to get messy. There is no question it's going to get messy, but guess what? This technology has been around long enough that we have plenty of evidence to show that there has not been a total wholesale uh, reversal of, of health and well-being. Uh, I happen to have two children in their early 20s, or actually now mid and late 20s, who, as far as I can tell, are neither serial killers or um, uh, in, any way, uh, in any way abnormal or, or unacceptable, and they were exposed to this technology at a young age. Uh, and so there are many, many people young. And when I look at young people today, I don't see a generation of people who have been harmed by the technology. I see a generation that is healthier and more productive than any generation in history. And when I look at these statistics on, on how young people are doing, teen suicides, everybody says, oh my God, cyberbullying is causing teens to jump off bridges left and right. Well, since the advent of the internet, when teens have been going online at a steady pace, suicide among teenagers has actually declined slightly. Sexual victimization against teenagers has dramatically decreased during the age of the Internet. And since the 90s, it's gone down by something like 68%. This, by the way, was not made up by me. It's by the Crimes Against Children Research Center, which is funded by the Justice Department, which is run by real scientists, social scientists, that are not using SurveyMonkey for their studies. They're actually doing real research, you know. And the data is overwhelmingly positive. By almost every risk factor that you could look at, except poverty and obesity, Children and young people are doing better today than they were doing 20 years ago. So this notion that somehow the Internet is turning our children into uh, morally corrupt, bankrupt victims of horrendous crimes is not true. So, Larry, now, oh, I'm sorry, John. Was this, this is are you suggesting that because of the Internet? No, I want to make down? it very clear. Uh, as a former sociologist, I have my degree within doctorate within survey research, that uh, a correlation does not mean a causation. Or a correlation does not cause, is not a causation. So if a child was bullied and committed suicide, that does not necessarily mean that the bullying led to the suicide. It may, it may not. And the fact that the Internet has risen while teen victimization has gone down does not necessarily mean that uh, the Internet has caused teen victimization to go down. But anybody who claims it's gone up as a result of the Internet is obviously not paying attention to the fact that it hasn't gone up. So you can't make that argument. You might be able to make other arguments. Now, having said that, I think we all agree, and this is almost a cliche, one child bullied is one child too many. One child exposed to inappropriate content is one child too many. One child sexually uh, abused is, is one child too many. Nobody in this room would ever disagree with that. But actually, this sort of wholesale notion of protecting all children as if they're equally vulnerable may, in fact, contribute to the danger of children. There is the possibility, and there's some research that backs this up, that by t treating all children equally, by assuming that one size fits all, by, by creating these campaigns that try to exaggerate risk and instill fear among young people, that you could actually be causing more danger than you're preventing. And there's some data from this. The D.A.R.E. program, the Just Say No anti-drug program, was shown to actually have contributed 
to the use of drugs rather than taken away from the kids who went to the program were more likely to use drugs than kids who didn't take the program. There's also evidence that when you create a norms-based approach to education, that improves behavior. If you think that your friends are, are not smoking, you are less likely to smoke. If the people around you are not obese, you are less likely to be obese. And study, studies were done by, by two sociologists, uh, Perkins and Craig, that if you perceive that the school environment that you're in is a positive, empathetic environment where bullying is not accepted, you are less likely to bully. And so they have done research to show that rather than saying that 20% of the teen students at Lincoln High School are bullies, you point out that 80% don't engage in that behavior, and that improves the situation. You actually reduce the level of bullying. So this notion that we have to constantly be protecting and fear-mongering and, and scaring people into, in, in, into doing the right thing actually may be contributed in a negative one. Now, on the issue of, um, of uh, oh, and, and I also want to add, uh, bullying, by the way, is another statistic. People think of an epidemic of bullying. Bullying has actually gone down, not up. It is a, I can only speak for the U.S. Uh, I haven't studied the, the European data or Asian data, but I know that in the U.S. bullying has actually decreased slightly over the last few years, and cyberbullying is not on any kind of meteoric rise. Of course, it's higher than it was 20 years ago because it didn't exist 20 years ago. But there is not an epidemic. It is affecting, depending on the study, anywhere from 6 to 25 percent of, of the teen population, the youth, youth population. But getting back to this notion of protecting, when it comes to protecting children against themselves, the best medication, and John said, quoted me, actually, I'm the one who coined that term, the best solution or the best filter is not the one that runs on the device, but the one that runs between the child's ears. I said that in 1997 at, a, at an American Lynx Up event. And that has been true ever since. The reason for that is that even if you are successful in protecting a child from bir age birth to 18, which is the age of majority in the U.S., with any luck, that child is going to turn 18. And with any luck, that child is going to be an adult for a lot longer than they were a child. They're likely to live into their 80s or 90s or today, perhaps to 120. And if you can get that filter working between the brains, within the brain, and instead of this constant protectionism, this constant don't do this, don't do that, don't access this, if you can get that filter working, not only will it actually protect them during their childhood, but will protect them during their adulthood. And we have seen too many cases of kids going off to college, 18 years old, they, you know, the switch got pulled, last week you're a child and you're filtered, and you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do this, today you're a college student, you can do whatever you want. We've seen too many cases where things have gone really sour as a result of them not being psychologically prepared to handle adulthood. So I really think it's important that in the name of protecting children, we don't bubble wrap children. We provide children with, with leadership, we provide them with good role models, we provide them with good education, we accept the fact that it's gonna be a little bit messy, uh, we do what we can, we protect vulnerable children, but not treat every child as vulnerable. And I think that is going to be a healthier and safer environment for our children than this constant overprotection. Thanks, Larry. Uh, that was quite a speech. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, uh, I, will, I will have John to respond to you and uh, just want to say that, I mean, what we are trying to, to reach out is um, how do we achieve that state? You know, how do we give that empowerment to children, the rights, and at the same time protect one single child? So that's the challenge, that's the big challenge that's ahead of us. And um, both of you were right in the sense that there is no uniform vulnerability and it, uh, we know that it varies across the board, across the region, across cultures. So we have to be cognizant of uh, all these uh, differences and diversity uh, when we apply our measures. Uh, John, you would like to... Uh, to let's take, take, let's take uh, p pornography um, as an example of the kind of material which I think is available um, uh, too easily to, to, to minors. Now there's a, a lot of research being done particularly in the 60s and 70s, about whether porn is a good thing or a bad thing, whether it ha has an adverse effect or a no effect uh, on, on, on people. Uh, the problem with that old research is essentially two, twofold. First of all, what they meant by pornography then, generally speaking, was a picture of a naked lady uh, in the center of a magazine like Playboy or something like that. It was, 
In, it's, it's what today would, would be called certainly soft porn. It might even not be classified as porn uh, anymore it because it's so... In the Sunday supplement today, it would be called uh, or what, it, Perhaps it, 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 even that. The kind of, when I speak about pornography and the kind of concerns that exist around that, I'm talking about pictures and images of violence towards, generally towards women, certainly highly misogynistic, uh, often bizarre, uh, sorts of sexual practices which never before in human history have, have, has been available on the scale that it is now, 24-7, 365 days a year, uh, free, constantly there on tap. We are at the moment living in the middle of, I can't remember who said this first, sadly it wasn't me, but we are at the moment living through the biggest experiment ever in the, in, in the upbringing of children. And I certainly don't think it can possibly be to the good. And I can't prove it because there aren't the longitudinal studies. There aren't the kind of long-term in-depth analyses of the impact of this material on children. But I, I guess every, every kind of instinct that I have and some, some preliminary research findings suggest that exposure to that type of material to, to, to children is completely distorting, particularly girls' ideas of self-worth and self-image and things of that kind. Now, I think that is a, exactly the kind of material where there ought to be, the, the precautionary principle ought to be applied. We ought to be better, be able to do better to preserve uh, particularly younger people from being exposed to that kind of material are better than we are now. Now, some people say that's a limitation on their free speech rights. Well, I think it, it, may, it may well be a limitation on some people's free speech rights, but the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child repeatedly makes it clear that it is perfectly legitimate to restrict certain rights or certain access or however you want to put it in, in order to defend children or protect children's health upbringing, uh, well-being or whatever. Uh, and, and I think it applies not just to pornography, by the way. I just think that's, that's the one that most people speak about most frequently. But I think it can apply equally to other things. Now, we have to, act, we have to decide, are we, willing, are we willing to put up with that limitation or aren't we? Uh, is it worth taking that step to protect children or are we willing to let it all, let it all go and just see what happens 20 years down the track? A very quick response. That same technology that blocks this horrendous material that I agree is certainly misogynistic and offensive. I don't know yet whether or not it caused any harm, but I do know it is offensive. Also often blocks social media and also blocks the other day I wanted to go to a wearable computing conference website and I happened to be in a coffee shop that used the filter and I couldn't get there. So aside, and I think we would all agree that that's an aberration of, of what is intended, but social media is very, very different than hardcore pornography. All right, so um, we move on to our, and I'm sure you, would, you are really, really eager to share your thoughts into this. Just hold on. Um, let us hear from our other distinguished panelists um, who will shed more light on this issue. So, Janice, if you don't mind. Yes, certainly. I'd like to pick up on a couple of points, but first of all, I'm going to talk about the three Ps, positive, parent, and partnership. I was a little curious when I heard that internet's trying to be too many things because in fact internet is what we're all making of it. We were voting in our last session on who is responsible for what internet is and there were many young people amongst us and the answer was me, that we are all the ones that are responsible and yet we did hear, well I wasn't around but we did hear back in the, 15th, the 16th century the very same argument against books. It was going to do this, it was going to do that, and I don't think that books harmed us, and now they're trying to get us and get young people to read books all the time. I think that today we are in a, a very broad, uh, in fact, broader than ever, social and educational space, which has so many opportunities, and yes, certainly, there are many things that we have to look at within these opportunities. One thing that concerns me, for example, is uh, the latest research on neuroplasticity that shows that when we use the computer, 
uh, intensively, we use certain parts of our brain, but are perhaps neglecting the prefrontal lobe, which helps us look at the consequences of our action. As educators, and I do represent 30 ministers of education, as well as the INSEF network here, I think that we have to be conscious of that, and this is why with young people, we, sorry, can you just show, we have developed things like this with young people on trying to get them to reflect and really find a way of balancing what they're probably not getting because it takes a little while for the evolution of the human brain to catch up with what's going on and the way we're learning. Next, if I look at positives, um, first of all, for young people, we need positive content and we need positive experience. I have been involved in education for 48 years now, as a teacher, I mean, not as a student. And one thing that I've learned is when there is positive, kids don't really go seeking the negative. Although there is an exception, kids absolutely love filters and blocking because it's the biggest challenge they get technically to find ways around it. So perhaps we should keep them up there. Kids are getting much smarter technically by having to get around them. Um, but when I talk about examples, and perhaps one thing that they did forget in the UN, UN Convention of the Rights of the Child is for a child to have its right, it also has to have a parent who is able to let it grow enough to be able to appreciate those rights. So I think the whole thing depends on uh, positive experiences, positive learning, but also through the parent. John was particularly concerned about three and four-year-olds. But I would say that we can draw a parallel here. Babies, why do we encourage that they are breastfed? It's actually because they get the immunity from the mother and then they really get a good kickstart in life because they're immune to many diseases and illnesses. And it's pretty much the same actually from my experience with children. A child who begins going online with a parent and who shares the experience, and when that experience is continued, then that child will grow sharing things, speaking to parents, and when anyone comes to me and says, what's the best thing I can do to protect my child from all these dreadful things? I say, speak with your child. But let's look there. Uh, no, I think there's an example. You know that the last, uh, yesterday, in fact, there was a very big Buddhist celebration. And I can't get the word right, Galen, Galandon or something. And it's a very, very important event, someone was telling me, because in families, they have to look at the good and the bad. And I said, but why the bad? And why would you make a sacrifice to the bad? And someone explained to me that you have to have a balance. There is bad in life, and that's the way you build resilience, and that's the way you recognize good, and that's the way you're able to do better things and be better. But when I'm talking about parents, they're my second P. There is also something very important that you should know. We run 30 helplines across Europe. And we receive some, I, I think about 200,000 calls in a year across our 30 countries. And one of the problems that we encounter is that when a child calls a helpline, parents can see there is a trace that the child has called a helpline. And imagine a child in an abused family where they have no real support they can turn nowhere because the parents can snoop. They can spy on their children. They can find out where the children go. We, uh, Google held a hackathon two years ago, and one of the projects that was developed there was actually a button for the helpline that you can put on the browser, and when once the child has hit the button and talked to someone in the helpline, the button disappears and everything is wiped off the computer so it's absolutely not visible 
that the child visited the helpline. It is a really poor society when we need to bring things like this in, but I think we can't continually think that if a parent puts a blocking device on the child's computer, um, that it is necessarily a good thing. Uh, thirdly, I'd like to talk about partnerships because in the session that we just did, we drew up six strategies for the future. It very much came up that education, e-confident carers, privacy by default, but also that together we should develop norms. But industry was considered to be one of the most important players. And I think that we should look at the fact that industry is bringing innovation. We need this innovation to keep progressing for the good and for the bad so that we in society can weigh this up, can balance it, and can find the way forward. And lastly, it's a total illusion to think that young people can learn to use these social tools by themselves. They need help, and yet schools really aren't handling this. We did a project called Social Media and Learning and Education. A hundred teachers across the world worked with us, and the key thing that came out, if we really want children to have their rights respected, if we really want them to get the best out of internet, learning in class to use these tools wisely, learning by example is most important. I finish with the words of Benjamin Franklin, children are great imitators, so let's give them something great to imitate. Thank you very much, Anis. Um, it, you do um, mention a um, few uh, very important um, points, and um, you know, particularly uh, the issue of <coughs> giving access. Um, you know how immunity can be um, raised uh, at an early stage. I mean, we can all debate about the risks related to that. You know, if it's unguided, you know what what may happen. But definitely, uh, we are at a stage where we are starting an explorative journey. So. Uh, we cannot really have our presumptions uh, without undertaking the path. Um, and I'm sure people will have uh, questions to you. Uh, we are forming a kind of position here, um, uh, not very clear, but uh, we can see how it's going. Um, and uh, so I pass it on to uh, Naveen. Uh, thank you, Anjan. Um, I'm an Egyptian civil servant, so um, I have to talk to you about the Egyptian legislations and how we have ratified every single important legislation concerning the right of the child, and uh, we have also promulgated our own child law. And uh, I have a list here of five, six uh, legislations, and maybe I can read to you the text. But I would like to spare you this, <laughs> really. <laughs> So, briefly, yes, our legal framework is in place, okay? So, theoretically, all is fine, all is set very well, and practically, the situation is completely different. Um, I'm very proud to be a civil servant and at the same time to be someone who has been working maybe with many members of, uh, of the panel here and someone who has worked also with Egyptian children. And I have to say that on the level of freedom of expression and protection, uh, we are facing a very uh, big challenge because uh, our country is going through um, a real transformation, a social, economic, and political transformation. And this transformation that is happening offline is happening also online. So uh, while we have actually all these uh, treaties, all these uh, laws uh, in place that are trying to balance as much as possible between the rights and the protection of the child, we find that society uh, is actually being polarized. We have like a dichotomy. On the one hand, we have schools and parents uh, who are trying to overprotect the children, uh, overprotect them sometimes at the expense of their um, of freedom of expression, as long as they are safe, as long as they are not exposed to any risks or threats online, as long as their culture, their uh, principles, their values, uh, their religion is well preserved. This is one one uh, camp. And on the other hand, we have a community, civil society 
are children in the streets, children who have actually taken to the streets in, in 2011 in the Egyptian Revolution and again on the 30th of June, who, have been, uh, who are actually uh, younger than 18 and who have been extremely, extremely uh, active on Facebook without uh, uh, revealing their real age, who have been extremely active on Twitter as well, and who have to a large extent reshaped um, the, the political agenda. I know of several names of those children who have not reached uh, the age of 18, thus they are children according to the UN Convention, who have been actually engaged in, civil, uh, in the civil movement that have taken place in political movements who have been killed and, um, uh, in these movements. So we have uh, two, two, two scenes actually, the, the school and uh, the, the, the household that is trying to overprotect, then um, the, the, the streets or the children who have access to the internet in uh, IT clubs who do, are not, uh, who, that are not uh, uh, completely supervised and who have actually shaped the political agenda of Egypt to a large extent and who have been actually pushing also the border lines of what could be uh, acceptable uh, by the child. And, and I think that we are facing quite a big challenge and uh, this challenge is faced by teachers, by the educational institution, uh, by parents and by the society at large and that it requires really a social uh, uh, dialogue to, to set really the rules of the game or to set some basic principles for, uh, for uh, online, uh, online interaction of children. We still have a very long way forward because I think that these rules are not yet uh, clear, they are not yet set and they require really a, a, a real peace peer dialogue, peer-to-peer -peer dialogue. They also require something that until now I don't see enough uh, of in the Egyptian society, which are NGOs concerned with the right of the child online, not just the right of the child for, um, for life, uh, for, uh, uh, for physical protection, for food, but also the right of the child um, uh, for expression of opinion. I think our NGOs are busy doing other things for the moment. But we, I also have strong hopes that um, we have a strong uh, institute, the National Council for Childhood and Motherhood, uh, that uh, is uh, trying uh, to integrate new text in the, Egyptian, the new Egyptian constitution that is currently being um, uh, written about the rights of the child. And I hope that this um, Council for Childhood and Motherhood would also have uh, uh, strong activities on the ground. They have history in, in um, awareness raising and I hope that they will continue along uh, this line. Uh, so uh, finally I have to say that um, the solution is not, again, it's not a zero-sum game as uh, John mentioned and um, um, it, the, the guided supervision or the, the, the the, the, the media literacy of the parents and the teachers and society in general is irreplaceable uh, for, for to guide the child, particularly that the child has outgrown actually uh, the teacher sometime and his own parent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anis. Um, and uh, last but not the least, uh, I mean, I'm breaking all the conventions here. Um, we normally give the floor first to our young speaker, uh, but in the flow of our discussion, I think you would get the highlight here. We need to hear from you. Uh, what is your thought uh, on this issue? Because uh, that's what kind of is the representation of the youth and the ch children um, in this room and outside. Um, your honest thoughts on this. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, this is Yanis from Ducky Foundation. Maybe I just a uh, little bit background about our foundation. And actually, our foundation, uh, is, our mission is to really create a kids friendly internet for this uh, dark kids domain, which like that means like for example we can have like the dot dot U N C L C dot kids, which basically will provide like an easy a easy understanding of the this convention for the children so that they can understand the rights better and they can like find this uh, they can find more kids friendly content in this like dedicated space for them because I think uh, what we're talking right now about like how we can really protect the children on this internet uh, because out there there are a lot of like uh, harmful content for them and uh, and but at 
the same time, we really want to balance their rights. Um, so I think actually both uh, they they have the rights to protection as well as their rights to like freedom of expression and information. And and I think what what is very important is how how we can draw the balance. And that's really a challenge I can see from what what most of the uh, of the panelists have shared. But uh, what was so what I want to raise is. Uh, it is really important that we, we really engage and empower the truth in, in this discussion and instead of just, I mean, like the industry ourselves that we think what we can do and what I think because um, actually, I mean, uh, because the truth and they, they do know, actually know better what they want and uh, what they really think is good for them. I mean, and, and so uh, in order to like really, really uh, make this, I mean, make sure this uh, this uh, the rights is being I mean being uh, uh, being like empowered or heard. I think is is really important that we engage them in the process. Because right now, I think uh, of course, uh, actually, Diana said they you have a panel just now that in, involve a lot of young people, which is good. But uh, at at the same time, I mean, uh, right now in the policy making level, actually, I think there's really not enough like involvement with the uh, with the young people even. I mean, is is usually they they speak, but I mean, when when we make policy, we actually didn't really involve those opinion from. Uh, I mean, I think uh, so. Actually, I I think with this uh, our foundation is with this uh, Dakis Foundation. Actually, we're hoping to like really involve have a Trudan advisory council that we can get Trudan to join in and discuss with a guideline that we can put in place and to set a framework that, uh, I mean, it can it can imply for and this uh, internet name space that is specially for them and so to make sure it is it is a it is a good place for them and yeah so I think I think uh, we always forget I mean we always just focus on what the parents want that is really want to protect them but we never hear what the children that really really want and because sometimes they don't really want the privacy to be invaded and as such yeah. Thank you very much. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, do you yes. think you are being overprotected? Well, actually, I, I would say because actually I'm I'm not under 18 right now, and I, I'm not really a trudan, and and so I, I think I, I have my I mean I I'm a fully independent adult right now. Uh, so because actually there is over there is some some other younger panel maybe they're like a better I'm coming to them yeah a better target on. to ask this question. Absolutely. Absolutely, um, because uh, the reason why I ask this question is because uh, we need to uh, to understand, you know, the position and uh, whether it's it's a segment of the society that feels that children are overprotected. What do children feel themselves? Uh, do they? And uh, of course, you, now you're in adult, and we will come back to our younger population out there. Um, before I open up uh, to the floor, just a quick. Um, thought a realization that, and this is in agreement with what John had said earlier, and we had spoken about this many a times, is that uh, we do fundamentally believe in the, the need for education awareness, and we are all seeing that, we are hearing that a lot. Um, in, in areas where the education doesn't reach the intended population, right, uh, whether it's because of the family, uh, because of the parents perpetrating the abuse against the child, uh, the child being under the age of uh, understanding the education, maybe the formal conventional education, we may need to think of alternate forms of education in those uh, areas, is that what do the ownership of the states, what is the accountability of the state and other stakeholders in terms of protection? And I'm not talking about uh, depriving protection that impinges in the rights of the child. I'm just alluding to the fact that there must be a parallel complementary setup that must be put in place uh, where education fails to achieve the intended purpose, right? So, I mean, just a thought that I wanted to share with you in relation to this discussion. And with that, I open up uh, the floor to feed into uh, this very thought-provocative uh, topic, uh, discussion. Uh, anybody want to go first, brave enough? Um, how about, okay, so Susie here. And I will take a few more hands before. Is there anybody else? Okay, um, you there, right? So I will now. I'm coming back to my convention. I'm giving to the young people first. Okay. 
Uh, please introduce uh, your, uh, yourself, your, your name, and your, the organization that you represent. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Jian, and I'm from ICT Network Ambassadors Hong Kong. And um, regarding everything that's, you know, that the panelists have been talking about, I just want to share um, from a youth perspective. Um, I do think that, you know, it's not, I, don't, I do think that restrict, uh, restriction is not necessary because I feel like if you restrict a, ch a child more on how they use the internet, I feel like they would be more curious as to why you're restricting them. Um, this is based on personal experience because I have a younger brother. And, and yes, um, we, we, do, we don't really restrict him as to how he uses the internet, but we do tell him, like, this is how you should be using the internet. And since um, he is the youngest and um, I have another older sibling, we are the ones who tell him how to properly properly use the internet, and I think that it's important for um, that, like peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, like more uh, focus more on how um, older youth like me, like uh, in our teens, to um, really teach those of younger age how to properly use the internet because I feel like they would feel more connected and they would be able to like. Um, see them as role model, m role model m models. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yes, please. Hello. Hi, my name is Risley. Um, I'm from Denver, Colorado, and I'm a mom of an 11 and a half and a 13 year old of 13 year old boys. Um, I adopted with my husband our children uh, two and a half years ago, locally in Denver. Uh, so I speak uh, broadly with, uh, or connect with what Jan Janice had mentioned about their brain development. Um, unfortunately, my children have experienced abuse and neglect that has impaired their brain development more so than their peers. So their peers may be able to um, understand the, difference, the differences and be able to make good decisions regarding PG-13 movies or teen-rated games, but my children cannot always make those decisions for things that are rated age 10 or even age 7 at times. Uh, so there's a lot of ways where, uh, as Larry mentioned, um, protections that are in place really are not a one-size-fits-all. It really depends on the child and it depends on uh, their upbringing and also then the culture, perhaps, of the society in which they have exposure to. Absolutely. So your children are, are vulnerable and actually may need protection that other children may not need. Yes, yes so we, a, we actually have, yes. thankfully my husband w w uh, works in IT. We have a power strip that controls all of our TV, Blu-ray, Xbox, and you have to, we have to put in a password to turn the power on because We've put every parental control possible in place, and they have figured out how to get around everything. <laughs> um, and of course, then have made uh, really poor decisions, and and then scared themselves with what they've found. Yeah. So it does speak of the need for specific in attention, uh, case by case, right? So, and I mean that's generally true for all the discussions we are having now, um, Susie. Uh, it's kind of a comment and a question for the panel, really. I'm a big p personal supporter in uh, uh, lots of education and lots of trust for your children and um, uh, making sure that they have the information they need, whether it's safe sex, drugs, you know, whatever. And my kids have hideously liberal parents, so, you know, they have all that information. Um, the, the thing I wanted to say was that in the UK, there's a, there is an increase in peer-on-peer uh, -peer child children raping children, gang rape of girls and this is becoming a big, you know, it has, it's a big issue at the moment and so whilst the, the statistics might not have changed in terms of people, of children being murdered or, you know, that, those sort of statistics, we've seen a different side of, uh, you know, of life and I'm just, my question is, and I guess it's as a parent rather than as, a, as someone who works in a similar field, is do we know the impact yet of what 
of, of, of the access to hardcore pornography in terms of relationships, of, of the access to a type of material that simply just wasn't there when I was a kid. You know, my kids have both seen really, really hardcore porn and have seen it for years. And that's just the reality now. So um, that's just, I just wanted to throw that out. What's the long-term impact? Anybody in the panel would like to respond to that? Uh, Larry, you first? Yeah, I mean, Some of you may remember Nigel Williams, who was a um, founder of ChildNet and a, a, a strong campaigner for not only children's protection and rights, but also, I, I believe, pornography, against pornography. And he made an interesting comment to me one day. He said, you know, and again, and he I actually took a very different position. I'm, you know, your typical American ACLU member type, and he was a little bit more restrictive. But he made a comment and said that, you know, if you, if you look at the vast majority of people, most people can look at pornography and nothing horrible is going to happen. They're not going to be obsessed by it. They're not going to, uh, it's not going to make them violent. It's not going to cause X, Y, Z problem. But some people will. There will be always some people. And, and, and it's, it's a fair observation, and, I, I, and I, it's, it's hard for me to deny that. But that doesn't mean, but that's true with a lot of things. You know, Mayor Bloomberg wanted to limit uh, access to sugary soft drinks, and I kind of agreed with that because I think obesity is, is a horrible situation. But on the other hand, there are many people who can regulate, self-regulate themselves and don't need the government telling them how many ounces of soda they can drink. And I, I think that, that, that there is a, a tendency to look at the problems that exist and assume that we need to regulate the entire population because a small number of people are going to see something and react. And whether that's terrorism, whether that's uh, sexual abuse, whatever it is, there will always be a small number of people who uh, react. We do know, for example, and th this is, uh, I'm, we, I don't want to drag this panel into, how can I say this? We do know that people who commit crimes m may look at pornography. But again, getting back to that correlation causation, that doesn't mean the people who look at pornography necessarily commit crimes. Um, and so I just think we need to be very careful about that. I haven't looked at the UK statistics. I don't know how prevalent they are. I don't know if this is a uh, sort of a, a blip or a, or a trend. I, you, know, may, you probably know more than I do. But I, I just caution you that just because there are some horrific cases that have occurred, that we don't automatically make the assumption that these are happening as a result of the Internet. Because what we do know longitudinally, there are some things we do know. We do know that, again, to repeat, since the Internet has grown, since the 90s, there has not been overall, at least in the United States, a increase in, in and by the way, when I was talking about violence against children, I was also talking about sexual violence, that rape in the United States is down. Now, again, that doesn't mean there couldn't be a, a, a situation where a bunch of them occur. But overall, over the past 20 years, there has not been an epidemic of sexual crimes against young people uh, that has correlated with the growth of the Internet. So that we know from research, uh, and I, it's impossible for me to know what was in the minds of these people who committed the crimes that you're describing. Tennessee, you want to respond? Uh, maybe can I just say very quickly one thing re regarding the point that Larry mentioned and what Susie said, because they are kind of two different things in a way. Uh, you are mentioning um, the impact of pornography on children uh, and what are the, the ramifications of, you know, exposure from a, a, an early age and so on. Uh, what you alluded to, uh, Larry, is you know the impact of pornography on offenders, you know, and the impact of ex being exposed to pornography and then committing a crime. Uh, I, I think there is a bit of distinction here. There are two different things, and um, John can probably come into the picture later on the UK case, you know, the two um, very recent cases that led to the consternation. So maybe uh, we'll hear from Janice first. Well, first of all, your example with the soda and banning the soda is a very good example because ban anything, restrict anything, and that really makes it that much more desirable and kids and adults really go out to get it because it's not allowed. But the other thing, I don't know where they find this hard porn actually. I've been on the internet connected at least 10 hours a day for 20 years now and I've never come across it, so he'll help me find that. Thanks. 
But I was very concerned about this, and the only real figures I could find were about games. There has been a lot of research on games and very in-depth longitudinal research on kids playing games. And in fact, it seems that the findings are if you have a group of children who play games, violent games, anti-feminist anti games, uh, consistently, you have a second group who just play from time to time, and you have a third group who actually never get their hands on the internet because they're not online, it is proven that it's the not online group that is showing the most violence and who are the most violent. So you spoke about causation and yeah, we don't really know, is it because they're deprived of an opportunity? What is it? But I found that that information that's coming out time and time again uh, has sort of killed the debate on violence. And I think that perhaps uh, we sh it could be applied across other things. I can't guarantee it, but I think that we can learn from the areas where such research has been done. Just to open, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned California's ban. The U.S. Supreme Court overturned California's ban against violent games based on the expert testimony and research. Uh, they concluded that there couldn't, they could not draw a, a direct conclusion that violent games was causing violent behavior. And that seemed to favor the Supreme Court. Uh, Cho En Lai uh, was once asked what he thought the impact of the French Revolution had been on, on the course of Euro European history. And he said, it's too soon to say. Um, and, you know, I'm absolutely clear. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I can't possibly know. Nobody in this room can possibly know what the long-term consequences of this new environment are going to be on young people, uh, or indeed any of us. Uh, and I, I think the analogy with the emergence of books and, you know, in the 16th century or 15th century, whenever it was, or analogies about the emergence of television and video, I think they all completely miss the point because this is, the, the, the internet is such a qualitatively and quantitatively different medium from any of those individual things that it, it, it's simply obvious to me that we're, are, we are engaged in a big experiment. Nobody can know what the long-term effects of this are going to be. The, I think there are er, early signs from bits of it Bit, bits of what's happening on the internet that don't look good. Uh, surveys amongst young females in, in Britain talking about what their boyfriends now expect of them to, in terms of sexual behavior, uh, uh, pressures that young men feel they're under too. All of these things are being shaped and coarsened by things that are being seen in playgrounds and in schools every day. And uh, certainly there has been no period in history when anything like this has happened before. So to kind of cheerfully say, oh, you just, you don't get it, or, you know, you're, you're worrying too much, I just think is really not a very satisfactory response. You have to acknowledge, at the very least, that these questions are legitimate questions that need to be considered. And in my uh, judgment so far, uh, we are not getting the balance right. Now, all, not, you know, political bloggers and... Uh, you know, political activity on the internet. There's a whole set of issues that, as it were, outside of this frame of reference. I mean, I've, I've got very little or, or nothing to say about that, but I do think there are issues about the kind of content that's too easily available, particularly to young people, that, that do raise these sorts of questions. And adults and people who've been around a bit longer, they don't know everything, that's absolutely sure, but they've got a degree of wisdom that's, uh, that they've acquired over the years, and it's their responsibility as parents to balance all of these things together in a way that hasn't been achieved hitherto. And I don't accept the idea that the, the, the message that's coming out of Silicon Valley uh, is the only right, right way to go, and I'm afraid too often I think people just fall for it without thinking critically about what lies behind it. Uh. And Shuta, um, and so uh, we have one more hand here, right? So I'll go with you first um, at the back and then coming back to Shuta. People could identify themselves, by the way, if you don't mind. 
Northumbria University. Um, the, the issue of you know, finding the, or looking for the impact of pornography on children or young people, that debate has happened for a long time, pre-internet, you know, when it started regulating pornography, age-based restrictions on pornography. Obviously, they have to find a, a justification for restricting freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Now, it wasn't based on any credible evidence of harm that pornography pre-internet was regulated with respect to children. It was a perceived risk of harm, and a credible risk of harm as opposed to an actual evidence of harm was good enough justification for restricting um, sale of pornographic material to children. Now, what the internet has changed is, as John said, the, the, the quantity and quality has changed so substantially that the, the, the quantity and quality of, of, of porn available on the internet has changed substantially, which raised new, new challenges. Nobody is saying, suggesting that we need to have new controls from a legal perspective uh, for regulation. Uh, the impracticalities of applying existing pre-internet pre legislation was what prompted uh, new initiatives. I don't think anybody in this room disagrees that a child should be able to go into a sex shop and buy stuff the child is not supposed to buy. Right? Drawing the similar analogy, a child should not be able to access content which is not meant for a child. And whether it's up to the state to do it entirely, no, the answer is no, the state cannot uh, take up the responsibility of parents uh, in, in, the, in that process. But I think the danger is here, if we base this debate on impact of porn or the evidence of harm, uh, that, that, that's a tricky, a slippery slope, slope really, because there is no, you will find a few studies which point to harm, you'll find an equal number, if not more, studies which point uh, to no harm, you know, but we know that there are people who actually are harmed by pornography, if that makes any sense. Yeah, very good comments, I think. Um, yes, uh, the MP from the back. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Cairns. I'm a member of the uh, uh, UK Parliament, the House of Commons. Um, I, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, I haven't got an issue with that, and I think it's reasonable. And if we're in, in reality, the difference between paragraph one and paragraph two provides sufficient loopholes so that we can make it apply to almost any situation. And by focusing so much on that, are we not running the risk of becoming academic? And we're missing parents in this debate and because a, a view on the right of a parent would possibly overwrite much of uh, what's there unless, of course, it falls outside of the law. Um, so shouldn't we be directing our efforts towards educating parents, but also towards software developers, application developers, uh, hardware developers, to come up with solutions that better inform parents? Uh, one of the risks, um, uh, but I think probably a lot of that falls to, to government and civil society in general, but in terms, of in terms of managing that risk and reducing that risk in line with their priorities and in line with their choices. Yeah, well, I, I, I appreciate that coming from a regulator, a member of parliament, a, a, a person whose business it is to make laws because that, that is actually a very enlightened approach that if you're going to regulate children, you want to do so at the most local possible level and you can't get any more local than the parent. Uh, one of the things that bothers me in the United States is we have this national law that says that school districts need to restrict access to the Internet. If you're going to have such a policy, it should be made by at the lowest level, at the school district or the school itself, as opposed to a national law, although, in fact, that law is very, can be very broadly interpreted. Um, but I, I do think that even among parents, one needs to be careful that they put thought into how they use these technologies. So, for example, Internet filtering has been around for a long time. And I don't object to Internet filtering at all. I think it is a, an appropriate tool for some families. But I do object to these salespeople who go around and try to convince parents that they have a moral responsibility to install it to protect their children from these horrible consequences. In 2004, it was the predator. In 2008, it was the bully. In 2013, it's the privacy invader. And these, these, and these moral imperatives that one must install the software when millions and millions of children have grown up, including my own, without the use of that software and seem to have, as far as I can tell, done just fine. 
uh, these are the kids that are creating these. You know, they're the ones that are running Facebook and Google. They may not be running it, but they're, they're doing the engineering. They're the kids who are bringing us into the 21st century with a vibrant economy again after our generation blew it in 2008. Um, and, and so I, I think that, that one ought to consider these technologies. For example, the lady in the front row, Rosalind, um, uh, she had a, a thoughtful reason to employ technologies. But I don't think they should, there should be this moral imperative that you must use them. I think it's, again, every family needs to make that decision. They need to consider what are their other resources. It may be education. It may be a peer pressure. It may be parental close involvement. We, for example, our children, and this is, I realize, a, a 20th century vestige, they used computers in rooms that we had access to, so there was a lot of interaction. Today, with mobile devices, that's much more difficult, if not impossible. But we need to think about things other than just technological solutions but I do applaud you for thinking beyond just legal solutions. Uh, okay, so we do have uh, quite a number of hands going to Juta first. Uh, the, yeah, okay, here and back to Junita, right? So Juta, your turn. I have only a short comment on John Carr's last statement. Uh, Juta Carr from uh, Digital Opportunities Foundation, Stiftung Lee. It's not working? Oh, okay. No, okay. Jutta Kroll from Digital Opportunities uh, Foundation in Germany. I want to go back to John Carr's last statement uh, because I completely agree with you that probably no one in this room can know about the long-term effects that the Internet might have on children. But wouldn't that mean that the Article 13 that is already mentioned there on that wall uh, has to be rephrased because it says children have the right to through any other media of the child's choice and in this days this would also mean the internet but probably no one could have known what the internet really means when this was written down so what do you say about that <laughs> the uh, you're absolutely right uh, the the process which led to the adoption of the UN Convention on the Rights of Ch the Child started in 1978 and concluded in 1989 uh, so, in other words, they just missed a rather big moment um, in, in history, and there's no doubt at all uh, that the wording, uh, I think it would be differently worded uh, were it to be taken through now. That is not going to happen. There, there is no clamor or desire anywhere to reopen the debate about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Two things to say on that, however. One is the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is the sort of body that ha maintains ongoing sort of supervision or keep, keeps an eye on what's happening under the convention in, uh, on an ongoing basis is going to have a, is it Aya? Aya? Actually there's a lady here who knows much more about this than I do but my understanding is uh, with UNICEF's uh, very direct involvement there is going to be a discussion and a consideration of internet type dimensions to the child safety thing in the light of the in, in the light of the convention. So it won't result in an amendment to the convention, I don't think, or a new protocol, but there may be a day of comment and a day, an advice being given about how governments and uh, other agencies might interpret the, the convention in the light of the emergence of the internet. But just very quickly, you can see, I mean, there's all kinds of different clauses in the convention which, you know, are qualified or to some degree or another. And whilst it's true, and I, you know, applaud this, of course the internet should be available as a medium for children to use for all kinds of things, but not to harm themselves. And, and that's what the other clauses say, that there are, you do have a right, a legal right under the convention to, to make restrictions if necessary, if judged necessary. And we can only use our reasonable judgment. This is not, we're not, this is not physics or chemistry where you can go into a laboratory and put a little bit of this here and a little bit of that there and get a, get a, get a, a definite outcome that everybody can agree on. We have to go on, our, on the available evidence, and there is an accumulation of evidence about aspects of harm, and also our own judgment. And we can revise it later. I mean, you know, how many times has Facebook changed its privacy settings? Why? Because it's learned, it's developed, it's adapted. All I'm saying is, let's go the other way for a little while and just see what, how, that, how that works out. Okay, your turn. Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, Bianca from Docket Foundation as well. Um, so on the proliferation of the bad content um, that John mentioned and 
Susie mentioned, I really want to um, focus on the fact that internet is actually a medium, uh, and the bad content was not created because of the internet. It's just because now internet leaves a, a trail of all the words, all the videos that we see, and actually all the pornography content was there. I mean, like it doesn't, it's not created because of the internet, and it was only a medium. And I agree on the safeguard issue. I really want to share a really good quote that I like um, from the NAACE, which is a UK community of educators, technologists, and policymakers. And um, they had this recent um, press release, which I think was really good. They said, uh, pupils are more vulnerable overall when schools used lockdown systems because they were not given enough opportunities to learn to access and manage risk for themselves. So I think this really means, like, for example, driving, yes, obviously it has its dangers. Many people get killed every year, but does it mean that we don't teach the children how to drive? Um, and we're not asking them to speed in the beginning or drive really slowly, which they would probably cause block down into traffic. Um, I think it's just about taking the right midpoint and having the right safeguards. Um, so I think that is something it is good to think about. And yeah. uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I just make a quick comment on the first thing that you said, um, that technology doesn't create the content? We do agree with that. It's a channel. But, uh, and you said that it's content that's already produced, that's used as a, you know, technology serves as a medium. But we are facing new challenges here. We are seeing how new technologies are actually influencing the creation of the content. I can just give you a quick example. When children are being sexually abused, uh, because technology offers the, has the provision to transmit that in real time. So that's, and this was not there before, you know. So there are ways, you know, there are certain particular specific ways in which technology does have an impact in way children or young people are sexually abused. But I do take the other point that you said. So maybe I'll respond like very briefly. I think it really depends on like the intention of the people who did it. Uh, and technology only allows them to proliferate it, but then it doesn't, it, it's the original intent of the people who did that. Yes, technology did help in a bit, but then if technology was not there, they will find other ways. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, Janita, please introduce yourself. Okay, Janita Opadia, in ECPAC International. Two things, just to respond, I think, to what John said, UNCRC and the optional protocol. ECPAC International is currently actually advocating to look at the optional protocol on the sale of children, child prostitution, and child pornography because it came into force in 2002 and a lot of the emerging issues related to online protection of children such as even grooming, online grooming is not protected. So that has huge implications on the national legal framework and how children. So related to UN um, CRC Day of the General Discussion, which is happening in September 2014, it is looking at media and we're going to, uh, we are advocating to look at the online exploitation of children and hopefully come out with a general comment out of the committee to to highlight some of these issues which is not protected by the optional protocol but are very emerging and uh, prevailing um, globally. There, the other point to respond about the access to hardcore porn, let me give you an example. I think we all, just the way children are not homogeneous, I think not all countries are homogeneous and I think we really need to take that into context. We did a survey in five countries in Latin America and we did the same in Africa. Unfortunately, we surveyed a few hundred kids in each of these countries. It was the first time they were being asked questions on online protection. And a lot of the kids admitted to seeing hard porn through various devices. One of the things is we find that in these countries and other countries, they are also using cyber cafes to look at that. And there are cabins within these cyber cafes. I was in Maldives, a Muslim country. And cyber cafes had cabins. And there were children, there were adults. It's the same in Nepal where I come from. There are so many examples. In Peru, cyber cafes had cabins. Kids admitted to all kinds of things going on between adults and kids. I think the, my point is there are various ways children are doing. But I think there is also a risk of putting the burden of protecting children on the children themselves, especially when 
I think this is very convenient for the governments. When we look at child protection, this is one of the most under-resourced sector in a lot of these countries. Though UNCRC is almost universally ratified, the governments are not putting enough focus on looking at child protection issues and what that means to translate and to put in protection mechanisms or even education mechanisms or even mechanisms to train teachers, parents, children themselves to equip themselves because it needs resources, it needs political will, it needs to be prioritized. So if you put the burden of child protection, the responsibility on the children themselves, it's very convenient for the governments to shy away from these discussions and not to create those platforms and the political will to have these discussions with the children, with the parents, with the education institutions, with the industry, so that we come up with the best solutions. I think it is very convenient. So we have to be aware of this risk that we are posing by putting the burden of protecting children on the children themselves. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anita. Um, I think that captures. Um, yeah. Well, I want to respond very quickly. Um, many people probably don't know I'm on the board of NECMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And the work that NECMEC does, the work that uh, ECPAT does, the work that the Internet Watch Foundation does is absolutely critical work because they are protecting very vulnerable children. They are protecting children who are, who are the victims of crime, criminal, criminal sexual molestations and acts. I'm not arguing, nor would I ever argue, that, that, that we need to let up on those kinds of activities, that that kind of law enforcement. It needs to be vigorously done. And I think most of Silicon Valley agrees uh, some of the biggest supporters of these organizations happen to be the very industry that, that uh, John is, is, is very worried about. Google, Facebook, Microsoft collectively put millions of dollars into organizations like Internet Watch Foundation and NECMEC. I, I don't know about ECPAT. Um, so I think we need to work on these areas, but I also think we need to be very, very careful to distinguish between these criminal activities and again, what happens in the average household, whether it's in America, Europe, Asia, wherever it is, where there are not victims of crime, but normal childhood activities. And that is not to say that porn isn't an issue in normal childhood. I will admit it was an issue in my house when my child was 14. We had to have a conversation about it because I found that he was looking at it. And it, it led to a very short but extremely productive conversation about what is expected of people living in our household. And I think that, that we, we have to have those conversations, but again, be very careful not to look at the worst of the worst. One of the problems with internet ed safety education is for years, the people who were doing it were police officers whose lives were surrounded by the worst cases and everything they saw were crimes. And so their whole perspective was based on these horrible situations that they were professionally bound to deal with. We need to look at that, but also we need to look beyond that, and it gets down to that other question. You know, uh, there, are, there are people who are suffering from very serious diseases who need very strong medications, but that doesn't mean that every one of us has to wake up every morning and take dozens of pills to protect us against illnesses that we're not likely to get. And so uh, we just need to be cautious about that. I also want to quickly address John's... Pardon me? No, we, well, we do, but the, last time when I, but the last time I got on a plane to Chicago, I did not take malaria medication, but when I got into a plane to my Nairobi, I did. And so one needs to understand when one needs to be inoculated and when one doesn't. And as to John's point about the experiment, I kind of agree with you, John, that, that we are in kind of a situation where we have no clue what the future is going to bring. But uh, a negative doesn't prove anything. A positive, I mean, you know, as you pointed out, um, it does take time, but if we're going to sit around and wait another 200 years and do nothing uh, and not allow progress to go on, uh, then, then who knows what, what harm that would cause. So just because the Internet is relatively new and we don't know the full impact of, of, of things that are out there doesn't mean that we necessarily have to ha put the hammer down to prevent harms that we are not sure will ever occur uh, until we have some evidence that there actually are a high probability of these risks. We just need to, we need to watch it. I think we agree on that, but I don't think we need to uh, suddenly restrict progress just because we have no idea what the future is going to bring. I, I, I know everybody else has got to go, and I certainly do. I just wanted to say the precautionary principle is a, an established point of view, a very respectable point of view when it comes to the protection of children. If you have reasonable... Nobody's talking about stopping progress. 
Absolutely not. I want the internet to continue to develop and be the exciting medium that it is. But I don't think, and I don't think that is any way inimical to the notion that where there is reasonable evidence of, of harm or potential harm and the case is unproven, we should err on the side of caution when it comes to children. That's all. Yeah. Uh, I think we all agree with that statement that we should err on the side of the caution with a, with a you know, I, I, I don't want to... Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we are all in favor of that statement. Yes, yes. and uh, we do agree on that statement, uh, John, uh, very much so. So, uh, unless uh, there is... Uh, yes, okay, one... Any, any other hand? I think you get the final say. Okay, I have a passing statement then concerning what's, what's happening and how this will continue. Uh, Jonas Mekin from Electronic Frontier Finland. I'm used to representing young people here, but I'm over 25, so I'm starting to leave the job. <laughs> uh, so what I, what I wanted to point out is that I came here, uh, again, usually very worried about, oh my goodness, we here we have again this child protection panels. And this wasn't nearly as bad as I thought. <laughs> But I am saying that we are still obsessing over on what I honestly think are irrelevant issues in these. Talking about porn or child sexual abuse is not exactly what I expect in fighting when talking about freedom of speech and so on. I really don't think that anyone honestly will tell the John, for example, that no, don't stop porn. No, don't, don't, don't stop, don't stop children from from seeing it. I, I don't really don't think that's a problem. It's a problem. The enforcement may bring it. There may be collateral damage for others and children as well. Though that's the one thing I want to continue. But I, what I really hope is that the next workshop we have, we can discuss about something else than porn for a change. I like that as a personal thing and something I have with my girlfriend. Okay, yes. <laughs> Points taken, yeah. Okay, so uh, we, we would eagerly wait for the third version of this discussion next year, okay? So version three. And um, so unless there is a, a compelling, a pressing issue that anybody... Okay, Janice has a point. Anybody else from the floor? No? So, yes, Janice. So if you do have a version three, please do me a favor replace the word, uh, the word children protection, child protection, with children's well-being. I'd much prefer it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, doable. Okay, so with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone, particularly my panelists, and uh, all of you for uh, spending the last, day, the last session of the day uh, with us and uh, with your eager participation. Uh, hopefully... Uh, you will have a good evening today and see you tomorrow. Thank you.